Welcome back to the next presentation in our series designed to help businesses making small amounts of hazardous waste comply with New Hampshire's rules. This next presentation is going to look at the storage requirements that apply to all small quantity generator businesses. These are the things you must have and the things you must do with the area where you store hazardous waste. The list of requirements is found on page 4 of the SQG self-certification form, which is titled Section E, The Basic Requirements for Storing Hazardous Waste. There may be a couple of situations where you're making hazardous waste, but these storage rules don't apply to you. The first, and most common, is when you have a parts washer unit that is automatically serviced by a vendor you have a contract with. In this case, the vendor may change out the cleaning solution for the unit before it gets too dirty, such as on a schedule of every 90 days. Since the cleaning solution is removed from your business before it becomes a waste, there's no waste storage involved. The second situation used to be quite common, but is far less so now. In older photographic and X-ray film developing units, Solutions containing high concentrations of silver would be sent through filter units that separated out the metal. Since silver has a high value as a recycled precious metal, the storage requirements for these units are more relaxed. After all, who's going to mishandle silver considering how much it would be worth? We're motivated to take good care of that stuff. But how about all those other hazardous wastes? We need to make sure we're storing them safely to protect the environment and to protect our personal safety, not to mention our financial interests. These next requirements are rules every business with hazardous wastes have to follow as basic precautions. The first thing we want you to identify is where you're storing this stuff. Heck, you might not even realize where your hazardous waste is. Let's find that out now. And if you have more than one area, write that one down too. If you have more than two storage areas, copy this page so you can check off the required items for all of your storage areas. Try to be somewhat specific with your description. For instance, a description of located throughout the building wouldn't be good enough. Instead, use terms like by the southeast door or in the outdoor shed behind the building is just a couple of examples. The next item on our checklist is what type and size containers are you using to store your hazardous waste? Containers come in all sizes, with 5-gallon buckets and 55-gallon drums being the most common. But you may well have something different. Whatever the size, Write it down as well as what type of container it is, such as plastic bucket, metal drum, plastic drum, and so on. Item number three. Every container holding hazardous waste must be in good condition. But what does that mean? The first problems you should look for are containers that are badly rusted or severely dented. But how much rust is too much, and how dented is too dented? Here, you have to think about the waste that you're storing. A container holding damp rags, for instance, might be okay to store in a container that's pretty dented or rusted. But the same containers might be completely inadequate for storing a liquid. A big consideration is whether the container will safely and securely hold the stuff. Liquid wastes tend to be heavier per gallon, and if they leak, they travel farther and faster, so they need a safer and more secure container. A second consideration is how well the container will close and seal. An open-topped container that's out of round won't allow the lid to go on properly. A drum with stripped threads in the bunk hole will likewise not allow you to close it properly and a plastic bucket with a cracked lid won't do enough to hold liquids and vapors inside. Make sure that if you close the thing, it's actually going to hold the waste inside. 
Item four says the waste has to be compatible with the container or tank that it's stored in. There's all kinds of chemicals out there and all kinds of containers. Often, when we've made some waste, we end up scrambling around to find any reasonable empty container to put it in. But reasonable isn't always good enough. Many chemicals need a container that's made of the right stuff or the chemicals will damage the container by dissolving it or by dissolving the seal on the cover. Make sure that you're using the same kind of container for the waste that was used for the chemical when it was a product or you could end up with a big mess. While we're at it, we should mention that hazardous waste should be chemically compatible with other stuff stored nearby too. You wouldn't mix ammonia and bleach to wash your floor, right? Of course not, because you know that mixing the two would make dangerous chlorine gas, which could result in a loss of life. Be aware that many chemicals don't get along with each other, and if they're accidentally combined, they can cause dangerous, even deadly situations. If you have chemicals that are incompatible with each other, store them in a way that they can't reach each other if one of them leaks or spills. You can do this by making sure there's enough distance between them, or if that's not possible, by putting a physical barrier such as a berm or wall between them. And don't forget about storage cabinets. Separate small containers of incompatible chemicals with trays, such as in this picture. Remember, too, that liquids run downhill. Be careful when storing incompatible wastes on shelves above one another. Another problem we've seen is when a container is reused to store waste and there's residue of the original chemical still in the container. It takes a surprisingly small amount of incompatible chemicals to have scary results. In this photo, a waste chemical was put into what seemed to be an empty bottle that used to have an incompatible chemical in it. However, just a little residue remained inside the cap, and a half hour after it was screwed back on, the container exploded. The more stuff you cram into an area, the more likely you are to have chemicals that don't get along near each other. Do you think the operator of this area could even tell you what was in each of these containers, let alone whether they're compatible with each other or not? Keeping your waste and product storage neat and organized will go a long way to keeping you safe. On to item five. Containers and tanks must be closed and sealed. The only time a container or tank holding hazardous waste is allowed to be open is when you are in the act of adding or removing waste. There are several reasons for this. First, we need to reduce the risk that the waste will be spilled. Second, we want to reduce the risk that the wrong thing can get into the waste. The wrong thing in some cases might be sparks, embers, or other ignition sources that could turn an ignitable waste into an inferno. And leaving a funnel in the opening makes it even more likely that a spark will get in. In other cases, a closed and sealed container might prevent water from getting into the waste. You say you're not worried about water because your containers are stored indoors? Think again. A plumbing failure can, and has, resulted in waste flooding out of containers as they were filled with water spray. A closed and sealed container may also serve to slow down an operator who would otherwise put the wrong chemical into the container before they had time to think and realize what they were doing. And lastly, a closed and sealed container will keep fumes and vapors inside instead of spreading into your work area and your lungs. We all like to use funnels in our containers and tanks because they work so good at limiting spills. They also encourage us to leave a container open, however. If you're going to use a funnel, use one that can be latched closed and semi-permanently fastens to the container, such as by screwing into the bung. 
That way, you can keep the container closed and sealed without sacrificing convenience. Another solution might be to install a funnel on top of a self-closing ball valve that's screwed into the container. An operator will hold the valve open when they add waste, but it closes automatically when they step away. Here's a what not to do picture. Every container here has at least one opening, just inviting a spill or worse. Here's an extremely common example of an open container. Open top 55 gallon drums usually have a lid, a gasket, and a ring that gets bolted into place. It's so much work to open and close these containers that an operator will just leave the ring unfastened. An inspector will give you a lot of sympathy for this, but no regulatory breaks. Laboratories often have equipment operating intermittently that makes small amounts of waste. It's common to see a container such as this, where a hose will empty into a small container. Having the hose in there is just fine if the equipment is operating and waste is being added to the container. But when the equipment is shut off, this is an open container violation. Sometimes a special cap, such as the one shown here, can be used to take care of this. There is a small outlet hose to allow air to escape as waste is entering the container, but it's small enough that an inspector won't be worried about spills, leaks, or vapors. Another example, another classic example of a violation is a drum or a bucket with a screw-in bung, where the bung is loose or removed altogether. These guys need to be screwed in if you aren't adding or removing waste. Some containers are well designed to automatically close and work wonderfully, such as with this flammable can. Keep an eye on them if you have them, though. Over time, handling can damage them to the point where they don't seal anymore. Note that these are also used for ignitable wastes that readily vaporize. Those ignitable vapors in the air put you at increased risk for a fire hazard and health issues. Item six on the form asks if you store waste on an impervious surface. Impervious means something that stuff won't leak through. When we require storage on an impervious surface, we generally mean concrete or asphalt that's in good condition. It may be that you have something that will eat right through concrete or asphalt. Obviously, another material would be required for storing that stuff. Why do we want you to store on an impervious surface? Well, for two reasons. First, we want you to be able to quickly see if there's a spill or a leak in the container. If you were storing on dirt or gravel, any leak would quickly disappear into the ground without you knowing. The second reason is that a container will generally last much longer if stored on an impervious surface. If you leave a metal container like a 55 gallon drum outside on the dirt, it won't take long for the bottom of the container to rust. One day you'll move the container and realize that it's lighter than it should be. Then you'll find out that all the stuff that's supposed to be inside the container leaked out through the rusted bottom without you knowing. How about a wooden floor? Lots of old mill buildings have wooden construction. But don't store hazardous wastes on these surfaces. Leaks will seep between the boards to areas below. If you have wooden floors, put a durable, impervious material under any containers or tanks. Here's an awesome example of storage on an impervious surface. Not only does this facility have its hazardous waste on a concrete floor, but they went a step further by putting the containers on spill containment pallets. Nice. Our next compliance item, number seven, 
is checking to make sure that you don't have hazardous waste stored near a working drain. Drains go somewhere. Most likely you don't know where, but I guarantee that if a hazardous waste goes in a drain, it's going to end up somewhere else before you have a chance to stop it. And that place it ends up may be pretty dangerous or expensive. It might be that you just don't have another place in your shop where you can put the hazardous waste. It has to be near a drain. If that's the case, then the waste must be put inside secondary containment, which is a larger container or tray that's big enough to hold any spills or leaks that happen if the container fails or an operator is messy. This is a great time to take a tour of your building with an eye out for drains. Watch the floor for grates, sumps, and portholes. Look to see what's being stored on counters near sinks. Sinks are magnets for leaking containers because that's how we're taught to deal with leaking containers at home. But it's not the same in the workplace. Lastly, watch out for lab hoods. They frequently have a small oval sink in the back that no one ever seems to need. But if an operator knocks over a container while working in the hood, that spill is headed for the sink and then where? In item number eight, we have some additional requirements if our hazardous waste is stored outside. Your building might be small and there just isn't room to keep your hazardous waste inside. Or maybe you have processes that make a lot of heat flames or sparks, and your waste is actually safer if stored outside. But when storing outside, it's way too easy to forget about them. You aren't out there regularly checking to make sure everything is safe. For that reason, and others, we have extra rules to make sure that you and everyone else is kept safe. These extra rules include storing outdoor containers and tanks in secondary containment. The outdoors isn't all that different from floor drains. If a spill or leak happens, a slope in the ground can move waste rapidly to a place where it can do a lot of damage before you have a chance to stop it. And if you have outdoor storage, those wastes need to be covered to protect them from rain and snow. And secondary containment won't do any good if it's filled with rain or snow either, so we require that it gets covered too. While these are important controls, to be on the safe side, we want to make sure that your wastes are located a safe distance from things that are at extra risk from damage. We require setback distances from surface water like marshes, streams, and lakes storm drains, and private wells. Don't forget that your own well counts too. Lastly, be aware of any public water supply wells nearby. These are wells that serve 25 or more people. The setback for these varies from each, so you should check with your local government to see what the setback distance is if you encounter them. Storing directly on the dirt with no secondary containment is a recipe for trouble. You can see that the soil nearby is already stained from previous spills. And if these containers were covered, not only would they be dry, but it might have made them easier for the snowplow driver to see. Items number 9 through 15 apply to all containers and tanks of hazardous waste, no matter whether they're stored outside or inside. They include requirements for labeling containers and emergency equipment that has to be kept nearby the hazardous waste. Let's look at the labeling requirements first. We need containers holding hazardous waste to be marked so that you, your staff, and anyone else in your building can quickly recognize what this is and that it's dangerous. Think about the fire company responding to an emergency at your business. Wouldn't you want them to be able to quickly identify things that pose an immediate danger? Of 
course. The first marking requirement is to make sure that all containers holding hazardous waste have the words hazardous waste on them. This should help to grab everyone's attention. Second, write a description of what's inside. Be specific enough that it's really helpful, but don't be so specific that only chemists and rocket scientists can understand it. Terms like paint waste, used solvents, or waste acids are typical examples. Lastly, don't forget that if you can't see the words, you can't read the words. These labels or markings must be visible or the words are useless, and you'll be in violation. These market markings are neat and pretty on store-bought labels like this one. But if you run out of labels, you can mark the containers yourself. Just make sure that the words are permanent and readable. In this photo, they may have the words hazardous waste and a description of the contents, but it has to be clear and readable. Is there hazardous waste in this container or not? With this half removed label, we really don't know. If you have a minor emergency at your business, you want to keep it that way. That's what we want too, so we require that you have certain emergency response items readily available near your hazardous waste storage area. The first is absorbent material. We aren't fussy about what type of absorbents you have. They can be rags, sand, or any other material that does the job. Next, you need to have fire control equipment, such as fire extinguishers. Make sure they're the right kind for the types of materials you have, and make sure they're properly maintained. If you have ignitable or reactive wastes, you'll also need a no smoking sign near your waste storage area. We're not particular about how fancy the sign is, as long as it's, once again, clear and readable. By the way, it doesn't matter if you have a non-smoking facility. You, can, you still need the sign to meet the rule. We've been in non-smoking facilities and watched truck driver smoking on the loading dock right next to ignitable wastes. Lastly, the rules require at least two feet of aisle space on one side of a container. This is sometimes a challenge when you have a smaller facility and where there's a lot of people using it. Not only is space limited for the containers, but employees like to put things in the aisle because that's the most convenient place with room. You know how it goes, an empty space likes to get filled. The idea though is to make sure that you can get between the containers to check that there's no leaks, damage, or other risks to them. It's also intended to give you access in an emergency response, such as throwing down spill control or getting in there with a fire extinguisher. This same rule applies if the containers are smaller, like five gallon buckets stored on the shop floor or pallets, but isn't required for very small containers in a cabinet or on a shelf. Here's an example. If we look at this storage room, we see we can put a container in the corner and there's nothing else nearby, so there's easily two feet of aisle space. In this example, we could keep going right along the wall and still stay in compliance because there's two feet of aisle space on at least one side of each container. If we had so many containers that we needed to start another row, that would be fine as long as we keep two feet of distance between the rows. But if we think we can save space by adding another container between them, it won't work because now the one in the corner doesn't have any aisle space. To continue on with this idea, we could place another row up against the back side of this one and a fourth row and so on as long as there's that two feet of space on one side of the containers. Here's a great example of adequate aisle space. 
Making it neat to start with encourages you and your staff to keep it neat later on. Here's another winner. Nice job, folks. Don't let this happen in your storage area. An innocent oversight, to be sure, but a little more work is needed to get it right. On to item 16. The last item on this page is really a notice that if you have more than 220 pounds of non-acute hazardous waste in storage, you have a higher level of risk and therefore have some additional requirements to meet. On this line, tell us if you have more than 220 pounds or not. If you do, make sure you complete the checklist on page six. If you never have more than 220 pounds, congratulations. You don't have to fill out that page. That's all for this presentation about section E on page four. Our next presentation will look at section F on the bottom of page four, which reviews your shipping papers. We have more presentations to help you understand these and other regulations. But if you'd just like to talk to a person instead of a computer, we want to help. Give us a call at one of these numbers during normal working hours. Please leave a message if we don't connect and we'll return your call. If email is your preference, you can reach us at sqg at des.nh.gov.